Hi, I'm Jason and this is Charity and we are at Shearwater Cove in Seward, Alaska. We found this piece of property and I came out here with a couple of my friends to look at it. In the winter time, we actually came out here and there's snow on the ground. We came in a little commercial fishing boat right out here and we rafted it into shore and we walked around. Everything was frozen, there was snow all over and somehow we fell in love with the property even when it was all frozen and lifeless in the winter time and kind of quickly negotiated a deal. And before we even really had thought about it, too long we owned the property and then you know it was like what do we do with it now so at the top of the stairs we have a little division here the first yurt that we actually built is the one over here this is the one we just built this spring and this is the first one you see as you come up this one's a little bit smaller than the other two that we have this is a 12 foot diameter yurt from nomad shelters the other two that we have are 16 foot diameter so this one's set up a little bit differently. Probably got the best view because it's closest to the water. This here, the kitchen is outdoors. There's the propane stovetop people can cook. Um, we provide all of the pots and pans and cutlery. And they've got cooler and a tote for their food. The sink has cold running water. That's one of the main differences between this yurt and our other yurts. This one doesn't have hot running water, it just has cold running water, trash and recycling. And then behind this curtain here is the compost toilet, which each of our yurts has a nature's head compost toilet. These toilets are are super great out here. They they separate the urine or the liquids from the poop, the solids, and keeps it dry in there. And these um, toilets have worked really well for us. Our running water we catch from up above the cliff that's behind me. There is a big pond up there and from the pond flows this little stream and in the stream we have bolted a pipe that is constantly collecting water and it collects water, flows downhill into two big IBC totes we have. They're 300 gallons each and so it fills those totes and then from those totes flows downhill again, goes to a manifold that we'll walk by up by our upper yurt and that manifold feeds the rest of the yurt so it's all just gravity fed pressure. So this yurt is set up just for two people. We've got a queen memory foam mattress, um, there's a little heater here and then a little table right back here for eating. Um, it's pretty simple inside but the heater works great. It warms right up in here and people can get get in here, get dry and cozy if it's raining. It's just a nice sleeping area. This heater is small but super powerful. So it'll, it warms it right up in here when you shut the door. There's a little vent in the skylight as well. You can shut that vent and it, it warms right up. We have three season insulation in these yurts and so inside behind this white fabric is Reflectix. It's like bubble wrap with aluminum foil over top. The three season insulation does just fine in the summertime with the heater. Our property runs this way, so we have the ocean right behind us here, and then our property is kind of a long rectangle going this way. The stream that we walked across on the bridge is the lower boundary of the property, and then up here, high above us, we have this cliff band, and that's our upper boundary. And like Charity was saying, our water source is way up there above that cliff, so our water gravity feeds down, comes down that cliff, our pipe comes over here, so we'll walk up here on our little trail and we're gonna walk by the first yurt that we actually built. The two 16 foot yurts are an identical setup inside. We have them, you know, same setup. They're queen bed, futon, outdoor shower, and toilet. So we'll just go up and look at the second yurt that we actually built. It's the highest one that we have on the property right now. So we'll walk up there. So we knew that we had to do something about the trail this spring and we just dug all the mud out right down to bedrock or as deep as we could get. We built these wooden stairs. We actually hired somebody to carry gravel for us and he just dug it out of the stream or we have another stream further back on the properties. But each of these steps has rebar coming up in front to hold it in place and so Jason would take the hammer drill and drill into the bedrock to make a hole for the rebar to sit in and then you place the 
the beam in front of it and then fill behind it with rock. We um, dug all the way down to either bedrock or like the clay layer in the soil. When water does flow down, it just seeps through the rocks instead of um, making this muddy slope that we had last year. And we're still, we've only made it here with these stairs and we want to finish this last little section sticking with the st same kind of style that we've started. Right here, you can see the pipe coming down over the cliff. And as Charity was describing, the water is coming from all the way up on top of this mountain. There's a little pond and that's kind of like a natural rain catch. It's basin shaped up there. The water flows and you can barely see it through the trees here, but there's a little waterfall up there. And our pipe is at the very top of that waterfall, it comes to two tanks, which are about 100 feet above us right here. Gravity feeds down here. And then we have this manifold that just divides the water up go into the different yurts, individual valves so that we can, if we have a leak or we have to do some kind of maintenance, we can shut off that water line individually. The two yurts that have hot water and showers have two water lines going to them. Just one is supplying water to the hot water heater and the other line is just supplying the cold water. We found out the water heaters needed their own pressurized line. If we tried to share it with just one line, if you turned on the cold water, it would deprive water to the water heater. So we just gave them their own dedicated line. And then we have screens in here just to take out like big debris that may have made it down this far, you know, like a leaf or a stick or something so it doesn't get stuck in the water heater. And those screens are only on the hot water lines. Yeah, they're only on the hot water side so that they don't get in the water heater. Otherwise, yeah. like the, the sinks have their own little screen. We don't have any power here. When we're building, we have a little generator we bring out. We have a Honda, 2000 watt generator. So everything we've done out here construction wise is run off that generator. We use cordless tools, you know, we have Makita 18 volt tools and we just do everything off that. We have a, a chop saw that we can plug right into the generator. At some point we will have small amount of electricity in here just for like charging cell phones. You know, everybody takes photos with their phone. So it'd be nice to have some USB capability. Our composting toilets have a little fan on them which is supposed to help uh, vent and keep everything dry. Right now, we're, we're just not even using that fan because we don't have any power, but we've purchased solar panels. It's just one of those projects, set it up. <laughs> you know, summer happens and you're like, oh, well, what, are we, <laughs> yeah, what are we not gonna get done? You're constantly reprioritizing. Yeah, so this is the second year that we built and this one went up in the spring of 2016. And it is a 16 foot diameter yurt as opposed to the first one we went inside which was only 12 foot. And this is set up to sleep two to four people and it has both hot and cold running water so it has a shower in addition to the compost toilet and its kitchen is indoors. So this is the inside of one of our 16 foot yurts. We've got the queen memory foam bed and then we've got our sofa bed here that folds out for two additional people. Behind us over here is the kitchen. It's got the same propane stovetop and the same sink as the first yurt that we went into. We've got this rolling cutting board kitchen thing, which is great because people can move it around. There's not a whole ton of counter space on this counter, and so people can put this wherever they need it to prep their food. And then all of the pots and pans and dishes are stored on it as well. We've got our trash and recycling back there behind the door. The heater for this year, it's similar to, it's a propane heater similar to the one in the 12 foot yurt, but it is a little bit bigger for the bigger space. And this one cranks out some serious heat. Sometimes you'll come in here when people are inside and they just got back from kayaking and they're cold and they turn on the heater and it, it's like a sauna in here, it's super warm. One thing that we have learned through the yurt building process, because we're living in a yurt too, and building anything in a circle like this, you have a lot of wasted space when you put square objects into a circle. Mm -hmm. So you can't do much about a bed, big square, you lose a little room behind the headboard area there, but. Behind the kitchen here, you have a little bit of space that yeah, we have lost. We have this little bit of loft, lost space, you know, and it doesn't seem like much, but we've learned in the yurt that we're living in that we can just cut that radius into the countertop itself and you can fit the counter against the wall. We'll probably redo at least the countertops on these two at some point some and just point. give gain a little bit of space back, you know, and it's not a whole lot, but it, it even looks nicer just when the curves match, you know, if you can build it to match it, you might as well. But it's something we weren't thinking at the time, like, like, all right, we need to build a countertop. Countertops yeah. are square, you know, it's like, now we've learned a little. This is our shower house, and this is Jason's own design. We've got gavel loom 
on the outside and then there's this, these clear um, sun tuft panels and there's a bunch of kind of or dew on them right now. It's really cool to stand inside of the shower house and look up at the trees in the sky while you're showering. So the first half of the shower house um, is the shower. You've got your knobs here, you know, the water flows out of the shower head and on the opposite side there is a sink here. People can brush their teeth, whatever. And then there's biodegradable products for people to use while they're showering as well because our water does drain directly onto the ground. We always ask people to draw the shower curtain because Behind the shower curtain is the compost toilet as well as our on-demand water heater. We try to keep this half of the shower house as dry as possible. You can see there's the lines coming out the bottom. There's hot water going in from the black pipe like Jason pointed out earlier. And then we've got hot water piped into the shower and the sink as well as into the yurt sink inside. So 2015 we actually started building and we started with this dock that we're standing on is where we started. Access is the big thing, you know, like you come in here and it's this rocky beach, so getting material in here is very difficult. So we had to build just a place to store material initially. We had this dock and this kind of became our little lumber yard. We would bring material in by water. We would throw w wood into the water out here and we would tow it in with a kayak. We'd hike everything up the rocks and we would just set material here just to keep it flat and straight. So, you know, it's the only flat ground around. So this is where it all started right here with our dock. Gave us some access, gave us a platform. And then we just started moving uphill, working on stairs and bridge and just kind of went from there. Actually the bridge right here was first and then we attached these stairs once that bridge was up because you can't just have stairs going to nowhere. So we started working on that bridge, got the bridge across the stream and I think we were still like climbing up through the rocks here for a little while. And then the staircase was the very next thing. So some places we had to put concrete down, some places we just bolted directly to bedrock, you know, kind of on a post per post basis, we had made a decision. It's not like building somewhere where everything's straight and square, you know, we're working around boulders and holes in the rock and everything. So every little decision was like a big deal. But you can see looking through here, like, the crisscross of bracing that has gone on because yeah. there was nowhere to make anything straight and level so we kind of just built all around these boulders to begin with this this big boulder here being like the biggest obstacle initially yeah this first section just because we first were new to the process yeah new so. to the process and we we're like well how do you do this and we've gotten steadily we've gotten better and better at just building around things and bolting to whatever rock we can find but yeah, we got this first section done over land right here. Right about here is where it starts spanning the water. And everything under here was a bunch of old wood that we had salvaged from Seward that actually came from an old bridge in Kodiak. So they dismantled this old bridge. Somehow it got barged to Seward and there's this huge heap of old bridge timbers, like heavy duty wood. Me and my friend years ago found that pile of wood and we asked people about it and they said, oh yeah, you can have it. It's all just gonna go to the dump. The first thing we ever did out here years ago was haul a huge pile of wood out here on a commercial fishing boat. And that wood sat right here for probably four years. Like the ground is still disturbed from the wood sitting there. It sat there so long. But everything that the dock and the bridge is sitting on, all the big heavy duty wood was all free from that pile of lumber. And that got us all the way through. You can still see up in here, there's a few pieces of that old wood. But after that, we were just buying all new material. This whole bridge is built on that old lumber that we salvaged. Underneath the bridge, everything on land is built kind of on regular posts, but in the stream, we couldn't pour concrete. We didn't want to disturb, disturb the stream bed, so it's built on these gabions, which are just like a rock basket, kind of like chain link fence material. So we just moved all the rock out of the way. We put the gabion in the water, filled it with rock, and then you just kind of wire it shut. You just stitch it shut with uh, wire clips. So the bridge is sitting on two of those gabions, and the water can just flow through freely. Yeah. Doesn't change the water current, really. And The top of that gabion opens up, and you just fill in, it's like a box, like a wire box, you just fill it in with rock. You get to the top and then you put the concrete block in there and try to make sure it's not moving around. When it rains a lot, uh, this stream can be gushing, flowing super hard, and even with all of that moving water, it 
these do just fine. They don't go anywhere. And when we put those down, we cleared rock right down to the bedrock of the stream. Yeah. So when the water flows, there's nothing to like erode out from underneath it. It's sitting right on bedrock. So they're, they're solid. I don't think they're ever going anywhere. It's just so much weight in that basket. Yeah, and with the bridge pushing down on it, it really can't go anywhere. And then we started getting into areas like this where we only have like a little bit of room to work with because the stream's right there. So we started getting these, you know, this little Funny triangle shapes. shape. And a lot of construction, you're always thinking like, oh, I, everything's gotta be 90 degree angles and it's gotta be straight and square. And then we got to this point and we're like, nothing's square, nothing's straight, nothing's level. We just have to make things that are strong and sturdy and aren't gonna fall down, you know? So it was more just like adapting to what was here and figuring out how to, how to make it stand. Down here, we made a little concrete form. Over here for this corner of it, we poured concrete, just a few bags at a time. Yeah, the land, Escape definitely dictates how you build, Yeah. less than the other way around. When we're bringing people out here and they haven't seen it yet, they always ask like, oh, so when you bought the ground, did you like get machinery out there and level the ground? We're like, no, oh. you, don't, you don't get it yet. Like there's no leveling the ground. You, you can't get a machine here. Like we are the machines, so can't yeah. change it. This is all solid bedrock. The soil's so shallow. It's just like moss on top of bedrock. You know, you, you dig a shovel in the ground, most times you just hit bedrock. You know, there's a few places where we dug down a couple feet, we'd have like three feet of soil, but otherwise it's like bedrock with moss on it. So the, the fall of 2015, we had the bridge, this platform, these stairs, that platform done, and that's as far as we got. And that first year it was standing by October, and that was 2015. And we started getting better at things like, even at this point, we had already learned a lot and we we're like, oh, now we have something to look back on. Like this platform, you know, stairs to platform, stairs to platform. That's how you go up a mountain when you're building stairs. <laughs> yeah, we started getting a process done. Every time you build, you know, the next set of stairs, it gets easier to, to get up to here. You know, we had been carrying material up here, like through the mud, but now we were able to just walk up stairs and it just, that kind of stuff got easier and it made the next thing easier. So our business is called Shearwater Cove, and we have a website, shearwatercove.com. We also are listed on Airbnb, so each of our yurts is listed individually. We have a Facebook and an Instagram that we post on regularly, so you can follow us there. And feel free to send us an email or give us a phone call. Our number's on our website.